Today's scripture readings are from 1 Corinthians and Matthew 4. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement, and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did not baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be empty of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And from Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake, in the territory of Zebulun and Nepali, so that what has been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. If you looked in your bulletins and then you look on the screen, you might realize that I had a little bit of a, a debate within myself over which direction this sermon was going to go. And I've been working on it all week, but especially in the last couple of days, it seemed to become clear to me that um, it was going to take a different direction than what I had told Brenda on Thursday. So the Gospel of Matthew introduces Jesus' public ministry by quoting Isaiah. Those familiar words from Isaiah that we hear at Christmas time, the light has come. The light has come to, um, to shine on the people who lived in darkness, who dwelt in the shadow of death. Matthew introduces Jesus' ministry by giving us cause for celebration. And then Jesus begins to proclaim, repent, or turn around. The kingdom of God is here among you. The light of the world has come among us. This is good news. This is something to celebrate. St. Ignatius of Loyola, a name you may recognize, was a Spanish priest and theologian, and he is quoted as having said to one of his students, I see you are always laughing, and I am glad of it. St. Ignatius was a man with a reputation for joy, and the phrase laugh and grow strong was also attributed to him. Laugh and grow strong. And the reason behind that saying is that in good, honest laughter, there is self-forgetfulness, which is the first step of worship. And it is in worshiping God in spirit and truth that we find our only true strength. Another of my favorite quotes comes from Karl Barth, a German theologian. Barth said, laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God. It is perhaps a sad commentary on our times that we need to sometimes make the difference between redemptive laughter and derisive laughter. Redemptive laughter is that laughter that comes from joy or relief or from the wonder of being in community together. Derisive or destructive laughter is rooted in pettiness or vulgarity or cruelty. And oftentimes that's the kind of laughter that we see in the world today. And then finally, Anne Lamont. A current author, and some would say theologian, has written that laughter is holiness, that it is part of the life of God, and that to laugh from your belly 
is to worship the giver of all good gifts. Joy and laughter and celebration, these are meant to be a regular part of the Christian community, not something that happens once a year when we schedule it. This is supposed to characterize the Christian community in which we live and worship and carry out our mission. And these are some of the biggest antidotes to spiritual malaise or depression. And yet the church seems to let all of our joy be robbed, sometimes by getting tangled up in the same controversies and conflicts that haunt the culture around us. Why are we still struggling today in the church with the same divisions and conflicts and sadness that Paul was addressing in his letter to the Corinthians in those first years of the mission of the church? When Paul wrote this text that we just heard to the Corinthians, he understood the danger that they were in. The joy of the good news, which we are commissioned to proclaim, can easily be lost and forgotten when factions develop within the community. Paul was also well aware that in establishing these churches, he was trying to do something here that had never been done before. He was mixing together as equals People who had never had that opportunity before. Jews and Gentiles, males and females, slaves and slave owners, all coming together within the community of faith as equals. No wonder you can find Paul addressing these same concerns, conflicts in the church, in almost every one of his letters. The Christian community has always had to walk a very fine line between guarding the faith that has been handed down to us and crossing over into spiritual pride, and what could be worse, developing a contentious spirit, a spirit that enjoys pointing out the faults in others' beliefs or is so quick, is so concerned with protecting a kind of purity within the church that we become quick to brand others' beliefs as heresies and fellow believers as heretics. It is a fine line because if we truly do love God and we want to share the good news that Jesus Christ has given us with others, and if we believe that Jesus is the greatest revelation of God and that Jesus has revealed truth to us, then we have to be concerned with guarding that truth. But without a pretty good-sized dose of humility and love, we can easily become doctrinal fuss budgets. And we've seen a few of those, I think, in the church lately. We can become people who turn more people away from Jesus Christ than draw people to him. Or as Paul reminds us, without love, all of our good theology can sound like a clanging symbol, more of an annoyance than anything else. That is what Paul is trying to tell the church in Corinth. And it is a message I believe we so need to hear today. All of their wrangling over whose baptism was better or who was more right was leeching the joy out of their community. It was leeching the joy out of the good news they were sent to share. And our wrangling in the church does the same thing. The biggest complaint that people lodge against the church and have lodged for decades is that we are judgmental hypocrites. We hear that all the time. We, they say that we are a group of people who are most concerned with trying to tell other people what is wrong with them. Now that is a far cry from what Jesus commissioned us to do. Paul culminates his instructions to these people in Corinthians by reminding them of the cross, which is really a call to humility. We are not saved by our masterful understanding of theology. As much as some of us love to study that, we are not saved by that. We are not saved by being right. We are not even saved by being good, or at least better than other people. We are saved by God's grace, demonstrated fully and finally on the cross. And there is no room for pride in that. There is no room for pride at the foot of the cross. And that is such a gift. With that, the foolishness of the cross gives us the gift of freedom. We don't have to be right all the time. Isn't that good news? 
I find that incredibly good news. I try to be right as often as I can, but I know I'm not going to be right all the time. And I don't have to be. That's not our business. God has already done the heavy lifting. We only have to accept the grace that God has offered us and not refuse that same grace to anyone else. We are made free from being deadly serious all the time. We don't have to take ourselves so seriously. We don't have to have all the answers. God has the answers. All we have to do is lean in toward God. That is a freedom to celebrate. It is a freedom that makes room for joy and laughter in the life of the church. G.K. Chesterton once said, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Chesterton was an English author and playwright and lay theologian who often engaged with de in debates with some of the renowned atheists of his day. He lived during a time when people called that entertainment. They would come from miles around to sit and listen to these two debate whether or not there was a God. And often in these debates, Chesterton would be challenged and baited by his opponents to explain the problem of pain. How can there be suffering in this world if there is a loving God overlooking the world? And Chesterton almost always responded to his opponents, I'll explain that to you as soon as you explain to me how there can possibly be joy in a world without a loving God. Where does it come from? Chesterton's life and his writings were often infused with joy. Our joy is one of the most powerful tools we have for witnessing to the goodness of God and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I may have told you this story before, and if you've heard it before, I apologize, but this particular story had a huge impact on me and on my ministry. Several years ago, in the church that I served in Sandstone, Minnesota, Bobby and her husband, Bruce, were two of my parishioners. And they were the kind of people whose lives and attitudes spoke volumes about the faith that they carried within them. And during this time, Bruce was undergoing treatment for cancer. The doctors did many tests when they discovered a lump on his arm, but they were never, in all of their testing, able to determine where the cancer started from. His was officially called cancer of unknown primary. But by the time they discovered that he had cancer and they did all of the testing, they found out that he had it in many places in his body. Many places. And when Bruce Oncologist delivered that news to him, Bruce didn't act the way the doctor expected him to act. He simply asked what the next steps for treatment would be. And the doctor, wanting, I think, to make sure that Bruce understood how serious the situation was, said to him, I just gave you the worst news you could possibly hear, and you don't seem very upset about it. And Bruce said, you didn't give me the worst news. The worst news would have been if my wife or son had cancer. This is not the worst news, so what are we going to do next? Now, all of this was going on in their lives. Um, as all of this was going on, Bobby served on the worship committee in our church, and we were getting ready for our Holy Humor Sunday, the Sunday after Easter. And as we were planning this, one of the other women on the worship committee um, said, I think we should do this song and dance number <laughs> in front of the church. And she had this song that was done by a recorded song by a male quartet. And she said, I want four women to get up and, and sing and dance as a quartet, lip syncing to this song. So you hear the male singing and you see the women, and it was supposed to be very funny. Well, Bobby volunteered right away to be one of those four women. She would get up in front of the church and do that. But in the weeks leading up to that Sunday, Bruce's condition deteriorated rapidly. The cancer had advanced in his brain. He was no longer able to live at home. She had to move him into a nursing home, and treatment was stopped. And I think everyone in that church would have understood if Bobby had just said, I can't do this. I cannot do this right now. But she never said that. There she was on Holy Humor Sunday, standing up in front of the church with a top hat on and a cane in her hand and lip syncing to this silly song while she was dancing. And I sat there watching her do that. And I thought to myself, I had never seen a greater testimony to the belief that we carry within us that some way, 
somehow all is well, or at least our hope that all will be well. Since then, I have seen that kind of faith lived out in many people within the church community, but on that particular Sunday, I realized that laughter can indeed be very serious business. Sometimes laughter is the greatest sacrifice of praise that we can offer. If we can laugh, even when our hearts are breaking, we offer a powerful witness to the world that God is indeed good, that God carries us in his hands, and that we have a hope that cannot be denied, that cannot be put out, no matter what happens. Laughter is the kind of praise someone wrote that puts our insides right. The same person wrote, laughter is a medicine that reminds us that our sickness will one day be healed, and we shall be whole, and we shall be holy. Until then, laughter is the Elmer's blue that attaches us to the goodness that inhabits this world and to the gladness that hints at the world to come. Laughter is the Elmer's blue that attaches us to the goodness of this world and to the gladness that hints at the world to come. I believe right now, right at this time in our history, the biggest gift that we as the church can offer the world is our joy in the life of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we are people with both a crucifixion and a resurrection in our history. We know how the story ends. And though we have been given a part to play and we must play our part as faithfully as we can, God is the author of our story and our eternity rests securely in God's hands. That is where our joy resides. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, you know how easily we can get wrapped up in anxiety or fear or conflict. You know how prone we are to letting things come between us and get in the way of the message you have given us to proclaim to the world. Help us be humble enough to know that we don't have all the answers, that we aren't always going to be right. Give us the freedom of knowing that we don't need all of the answers and that none of us can be right all the time. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Fill us with holy laughter and let that be a witness to the world you came to save. As Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 